What's up, everyone? And welcome to That Crypto Hustle, a community podcast and a one-stop shop where visionaries, entrepreneurs, and hustlers share their blockchain and cryptocurrency expertise. I'm your host, Luna Vega, a digital marketer turned crypto addict, and my goal is to help spread blockchain and cryptocurrency awareness, all while fostering collaboration between all of us. If you dig the show, make sure to give us a review on iTunes, all while following us on Instagram, YouTube, and or Twitter. You know the drill. And just a reminder, anything we share in this podcast is not financial, personal, or legal advice. Do your own research. Let's do this. Okay, guys, thank you so much for being patient with us today. Um, And again, I apologize with some of the issues that happen uh, as far as getting in. But uh, super excited about today's event. Uh, We have speakers who flew in specifically to speak to us today from all around the world, literally. So um, before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about uh, That Crypto Hustle, the vision behind it, why I started the meetup, and a little bit about myself. So essentially, That Crypto Hustle started to be completely honest with you as an e-commerce store. So after going to an e-commerce conference about a year ago, I had a few friends of mine who had invested in Bitcoin and they were having a very heated conversation about their latest investment. And this was prior, I mean, this was probably like uh, sometime in spring, early spring. So when I got home, obviously I uh, did some research. I had heard about Bitcoin, but didn't know about all the fuss and everything that was going on. And it's almost like I opened up a rabbit hole. So at first I was like, oh, I should sell t-shirts to that demo. And little by little, essentially, um, I, I decided to create a podcast. And as I started interviewing individuals, it's almost like I went down a rabbit hole and realized that this technology, blockchain, is completely going to revolutionize um, everything, every industry. So it became more of a quest, it, first of all, to bring awareness, to make it more accessible to everyone bring more women into the space as well and uh, yeah so essentially I started the meetups in here in Barcelona in January and this is our second one super excited to have everyone here and we plan on doing more so a little bit about um, the guests so Crypto Ellis actually I Jack do you want me to say (laughs) so Jack was uh, one of the second person that I interviewed on the podcast He's based out of Manchester. He's a YouTuber. He's been doing it for a while. He's also a trader. You guys should definitely check out his channel. And uh, I've been following his journey, so it's been really interesting. So if you have any questions, like at the end, uh, when it comes to trading, he's the guy to ask. Um, Mark is coming from Switzerland. um, And essentially, he's the co-founder of Eaterbase, which is... uh, a, a place where you can essentially like do exchange and whatnot. So he's going to talk a little bit more about that. And RJ actually met in Miami in a penthouse at some ICO, I guess, was it like an Oh, yeah, right. So it's your project, right. So uh, at the Pitch Live um, ICO event in Miami, and uh, I also had him on the show, and he happened to be in Europe, so I flew him in um, for the event. So please give a big round of applause to all of our different panelists today. So before we get started, I like to put fillers in to kind of figure out how to guide the conversation. Who here has currently invested in crypto and is doing it on a pretty regular basis? Raise your hand. Nice, so we have like an advanced crowd, awesome. Who is uh, doing mining right now? (laughs) Okay, Uh, definitely wanna talk about that as well. Um, Okay, so I guess my first question for, uh, for you, Jack, I want to ask you, so one of the big things that's currently happening, and just yesterday it happened again, like is, is hacking, and uh, some of the issues that are currently happening, happening with crypto. So can you tell us a little bit more about how do you think that's going to affect the market, and, and what are some of the things to look for, and how you can you protect yourself? Sorry for the mic. Wait, hold on. Let's do this. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, so if you didn't hear yesterday, so pretty much all the ERC20 tokens, they got hacked. So in the coding, um, there was something in there where if you send your ERC20 token to like an exchange or something, you could literally get like, say if you're sending like 100 of that token, you could get like 1,000 of that token. So pretty much every exchange was stopping ERC20 tokens from going in or out. So the way that we've got to stop this is these um, the Ethereum people, they've got to like code it differently. Also, the best way to stop getting hacked is obviously putting your cryptos onto a uh, Ledger Nano S or these hardware wallets because if you're keeping them on these exchanges, it's a centralized exchange, so it's very prone to getting hacked. Also, with leaving it on these exchanges, they could literally just shut the exchange down or the government could shut it down at any given time. So this is why going forward into the future for cryptocurrency, we're seeing more decentralized exchanges pop up. We're seeing more solutions for um, stopping these hackings, like the new cryptocurrencies that are coming out. They're going from uh, ERC-20 tokens to maybe the EOS platform or the NEO platform, which is a bit more advanced than Ethereum at the moment. Ethereum is trying to fix these problems, but at the moment there's too many competitors that are coming up, and I personally believe these are going to defeat Ethereum in the long run if Ethereum just stays where it is at the moment. And Mark, you also had uh, some comments regarding the hacking. Sorry, Robert. Oh, Robert. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's fine. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, um, there is so much going on in terms of hacking and uh, even uh, regulators are jumping on the board. You know, we see that, let's say, you know, there was a uh, BitGrail that was a very good example that you have a piece of code which wasn't tested and uh, what follows are legal actions from both sides, you know, the developers, the exchange, and it's very hard for consumer to judge, you know, if it's safe enough or not. And clearly it seems that lots of needs to be done in terms of infrastructure regulators and both developers to actually come up with products that are suitable for the retail market. Because usually you get even people, you know, like elderly people, you know, buying this stuff because, oh, well, I've seen it goes up, I don't tenfold and, you know, they just get exposure. They do not know what they are really, really doing. And yes, it can create a mess and the regulators will jump on the board and they'll say, okay, you know, you need to chill out. So uh, I think uh, for the future, you know, it's, it's really important that we get some sense of a regulatory framework, which is maybe not global, but at least maybe in the EU. You know, the EU Commission and, you know, some bigger countries, they can come up with some sensical frameworks, even for taxation, you know, that they kind of, um, you know, bring uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, new ideas, uh, but that they are fully compliant and people are able to actually distinguish what, what is actually uh, safe and something that's a bit more, you know, sketchy. But compliance is also a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because it's probably not helping as far as like creation and whatnot and I mean essentially it's just creating more restrictions if you will. Sure I mean it's uh, in, in keeping the innovation to a certain degree but again if you are running ICOs and again you are inviting the whole world that let's come and invest into my project but maybe the project will turn out to be a pure scam that's uh, actually the thing that uh, we experienced last year that literally you had people who had no experience no technology behind them just doing pretty much paper ICO, just writing the white papers with some bogus content and people will still write in like millions. And this is something that probably needs to be regulated and uh, needs to be observed and people shouldn't be deceived, you know, to invest their assets, you know, even if it's a crypto. RJ, um, so I'd love to talk about what sort of happened the last, oh, you're probably really close to Um, I'd love to talk about what happened in the market these last few months, and, uh, and sort of what are your predictions for the future, why have we seen um, a rise currently, and, and some of the things to look for in general. Well, first can you guys hear me? Yeah. Guys, I can hear you. You guys have dinner yet? Come on. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. Come on. One more time. Hi, guys. Yeah. Right, what's up, beautiful people? All right. So. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> so basically, this is what I think happened in the market. So when I got into Bitcoins, I was a gamer. I was one of those gamers that spent a lot of Bitcoins on stuff that I didn't need. Guns and swords and stuff for my games. Now, recently, the, 
government, you know, last year, they came in, they didn't care about crypto at all. Most of the government and the financial houses. Well, apparently the CIA I've been censored, they're hearing me. <laughs> Regulation. <laughs> I'm being censored. <laughs> okay, so, again, you don't like this much. So, when the governments, you know, last year when they found out that crypto was going up and up, they realized that, hey, Bitcoin is not just for drug dealers and people want to buy drugs and people want to play games. This is technically where wealth is being transferred. Money is being moved from the rich to the not so rich and some of the rich. So when they realized that, they started to come in, they muscled their way into the crypto world. It's like they woke up late, they came late to the party, and now they didn't, they didn't want to pay cover charge. So what they can do is they can hustle you and force you to give up your crypto. The same thing they did with gold and silver for the last 25 years when you see the gold market and the silver market, it went up and then it got suppressed. Every time the futures market comes out, that is the playing field for the governments to suppress the price. Now, they cannot outright say, screw crypto, you know what? fuck everybody, we are not going to allow you to have crypto. They can't do that. So what they do is they suppress the price so that a lot of people lose interest. So that's what they're doing. A lot of people got scared. I mean, some of them committed suicide, then it's sad, but that's what they do. So the last few months, they suppress the price so that they can collect as much Bitcoins as they can because no matter how much money you have in the world, you can be the richest man in the world. If I don't sell my Bitcoins, you're going to know Bitcoins to buy. But if I scare you into losing money and you rush and sell, we get to buy all the Bitcoins. So what I think is happening right now, because you know, World Cup is coming next month. Who likes football? Are you all fans of Spain, I guess? No, Germany, yeah. No, no German fans? <laughs> Liverpool, by any chance? Oh, yes, never walk alone. <laughs> Five, two. <laughs> all right, so, you see, this is the first time in the history of World Cup where bookmakers, legal and illegal can collect money from anyone in the world, anywhere. Previously, if I wanted to place a bet with the bookmaker, I'd say, I'm from Singapore. I can't send money all the way to Spain in two minutes to place a bet. But right now, I can transfer Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, or whatever coin they're accepting, and place football bets. And whenever there's World Cup, there are going to be billions and billions of dollars is going to be gambled. So right now, first time in history, Bookmakers, both illegal and legal, can collect money from anyone, anywhere in the world. And a lot of money is going to pour in. And all the very rich, greedy people are going to start selling their crypto at the end of World Cup. So during World Cup, wait for it to go up and then sell. <laughs> Good advice. I like World that. Cup advice. Yeah. World Cup, here it comes. Um, okay, so we talked a bit... So another thing that's affecting the prices as well is all the regulations that are coming out as far as like government regulations and, and uh, the bans in different countries. So can you talk a little bit about that? The thing with, the, the thing with regulations is everybody thinks it's a scary thing, but in a market that's so volatile, we need regulations because like we've already discussed, we've got ICOs that are scamming millions and millions off people. We've got cryptocurrencies like BitConnect that shouldn't even have been in the market. And people in the United States, they didn't know it was technically a security. So they're selling it, they're promoting it, and people are going to jail over this. But if we had regulations in place, then all of this can be stopped. Also, with uh, these exchanges getting stopped and exchanges in different countries and the government shutting them down, this is the reason, again, that we need decentralized exchanges. We've already got some now, Ether Delta Exchange, and uh, we've got like Common Hood Exchange that's going to be decentralized. Going forward, we're going to have a lot more decentralized exchanges, and these kind of problems are going to be shut down a bit. So what I would suggest is when you see governments trying to cl close down cryptocurrencies and all this and exchanges, I would just uh, suggest for you to just block it out because like we've already discussed, the reason they're doing this is because they want to drive down the price. So i.e. the banks, so i.e. these other big companies can buy up the Bitcoin, the cryptocurrencies. Uh, Jamie Dimon, he tried to do it with uh, Bitcoin. He uh, kept saying bad things about Bitcoin. And then it went all the way down to, I believe it was 10,000 or something. He bought a lot up and then he sold it at like 14,000, 15,000. It's just how the uh, people with a lot of money, how they work in this kind of environment. 
Robert, so can we talk about the difference between centralized and uh, decentralized exchanges? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, just to be very frank, uh, on a centralized front, you know, pretty much the exchange will issue something like IOU when you deposit your crypto into certain account with decentralized exchanges. Of course, you know, you have various types of decentralized exchanges, you know, uh, let's say the ones that are based on bit shares, you still deposit it somewhere. It's not like within your wallet. Then you have uh, a couple new ones that are pretty much dealing with ERC20 tokens, where maybe, you know, the, the crypto actually stays in your wallet. But uh, so far, you don't have like the ideal solution for the, let's say, you know, all the tokens and all the markets, because if you imagine you have something over a thousand assets that are quite liquid at the moment, and there is not a one single entity in the world that uh, is capable to process all these uh, cryptos. But maybe on the other hand, you know, um, you know, I worked uh, for uh, quite a lot of time you know, for, let's say, European uh, institutions like European Investment Bank, European Stability Mechanism, which is a sort of the IMF of the EU. And uh, what I'm seeing at, right now, you know, is that literally it was uh, eight days ago that uh, the European Parliament came up with the fifth anti-money laundering directive, which is extremely um, precise in terms of uh, dealing with cryptos. And what they are saying is that essentially, uh, if you trade cryptos or you're somehow involved and you are trading either from cash, or fiat, or or crypto to another crypto, pretty much you're subject to same KYC ML process or anti money laundry process as you are dealing with the bonds like with a bank. So all the centralized or even des decentralized exchange in doing this business, they need to comply with this regulation. So this means that they need to gather all your data, they need to search if you know uh, you exceed certain thresholds either in terms of deposits or trading, uh, source of your crypto, source of your assets. And on top of this, on 25th of May, we'll have the general data protection regulation kicking into place. And uh, this actually goes against the blockchain in general, because uh, the main tenant of, of this regulation is really uh, the stuff that, I mean, the, the whole purpose was to protect the consumers that they control, they have a control over their data, they can access and see who is collecting what on their profile, let's say such as Facebook, and they also can uh, ask for this data to be erased forever. And then imagine that if you have any sort of your personal data on blockchain, the whole idea of blockchain is that it's immutable, you cannot erase it. And then imagine these two worlds coming together, you know, you have legal collision immediately. So uh, pretty much with this legislation, every single piece of personal data that somehow appears on the blockchain is pretty much illegal. So imagine that even if you have a decentralized exchange that needs to do a KYC, and they are totally decentralized, they need to somehow get your personal data, so they will never be GDPR compliant. And there is no ve very easy way around it. So, you know, legislators, you know, they sit in a European Commission, they sit in a European Parliament. Actually, it was a huge majority that voted for fifth uh, anti-money laundering directive. With the GDPR, it was a similar issue. So, I mean, like on political front, you know, the, pretty much the entire parliament just goes in a favor of these directives. You know, they created an environment uh, in which uh, I think it will postpone lots of this newly decentralized project dealing with personal data. And there is a literally no way to get around this one. So this is very important and we'll see how this will affect the market in general. Of course, I think, you know, um, maybe in the future, you know, uh, when the technology will mature enough, you know, that uh, we will have specialized legislation dealing precisely with cryptocurrencies. But currently, you know, cryptocurrencies are caught somewhere in the middle. It's not money, it's partially asset, and it's partially de decentralized. But then if you want to, let's say, change your fiat into, into, let's say, crypto or vice versa, it's not easy because there is a, not a single piece of legislation in the EU that says that every country has to deal it in the same manner. It's like a puzzle of various other directives that somehow, you know, making it even more difficult and that implementation in every single country is different. Let's say this example in Poland that when they, you know, you do one transaction that has 1%, you know, it means that the whole market, even in EU, will get fragmented. So you might even get traders or trading firms moving from one country to another just to find more suitable and uh, better, better uh, environment for doing their business. And I think if you implement uh, maybe the another round of changes in a world, as it was mentioned that 
according to US SEC, pretty much every ERC20 token as a security in a, in a more or less strict sense, then uh, it becomes very difficult to even run this business on a global scale. So what I perceive is that maybe this year it will be a major, uh, not in terms of new technologies, it will be a major year for regulation and maybe fragmentation of the market. So it will be very interesting to see where the things are moving, where the exchanges are moving, because we've seen that even the exchanges, they change their jurisdictions quite quickly. And uh, imagine that how can you have a stable market where the major players are just switching their jurisdiction on maybe monthly basis, you know. So this is the biggest risk and it, 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 as it was pointed out quite rightly, you know, sometimes it's really the government that gets scared because, okay, we can't control it. So, you know, they are just trying things out and sometimes it might not play very well for, for the actual consumer. So, I mean, this is just very quick input, but it's quite complex, uh, even more complex than we realize right now. RJ, what type of exchanges are you currently using, and how do you deal with your transactions on a day-to-day? How do I deal with it? Yeah. Well, basically right now, uh, okay, wait. Firstly, I'm building my own exchange. It's called Altrex. It's being backed by some of the biggest names in crypto. It's going to take about eight months to come out. Right now, I'm using Bitrex and Binance. Now, the way I move my money around is I don't keep everything on the exchanges because on the exchanges, like, what they said, they can close down and they can run away any day. You don't control the keys, they control your money. You don't want someone to control your money, right? So the way I trade on the exchange is when I do a day trade, I'm not a day trader, when I do a day trade, I always take out my profits. Don't get greedy, take it out and take it off the exchange. Now when you want to put it back, just put it back. Yeah, you lose a bit in money, but if you're trading small, then just leave it in exchange because you're gonna lose in transaction fees. But if you're trading in bigger volumes like I am, I don't really care about the small transaction fees that I lose because I'm key, uh, safekeeping a lot of my money. Because I have friends who have millions of dollars on Bittrex and I told them the same thing. If you lose access to your accounts, you lose a couple of million dollars. But if you are able to lose a few percent just to transfer in and out, so be it. Because you know why? Right now, the governments are running scared. They don't want people to be rich, so they're putting regulations, but regulations are regulations. It's not going to be able to control every single human being because this is what I see happening. Bitcoin was meant to be anonymous. Firstly, non-taxable, I like this part, non-taxable. If ever regulation comes in, full, full effect, even if they ban Bitcoin, I'll be very happy because they will then facilitate the biggest and largest underground market for Bitcoin for cash market in the world, which is good because they still can't regulate it and they won't regulate it. And same thing with exchanges. They try to regulate it so that they can get access to data of everyone is trading so that they can tax them. But exchanges are moving to Malta. Even us, we want to register in Singapore. Now I'm going to register in Malta because it's safer in Malta. And tomorrow, if it's safer in, say, Timbuktu, I would move my exchange to Timbuktu. Right now, no one knows and no one can give an accurate prediction of where a price is going, where the entire market is going, because everyone is just stabbing in the dark. They don't know what's going to happen. No one knows what's happening. The only people who know what's going to happen are the people who have enough money to crash the market tomorrow and bring it back up tomorrow. And the guys who can tell you, all right, I'm from Korea. I'm going to ban Bitcoin tomorrow. And then two weeks later, they say, oh, I'll come back Bitcoin. And China wakes up and says, I want to ban these are the only people right now who knows what's happening. Even I don't know. So again, when it comes to trading, if you can take out your money every day, move it aside. Or at least take out your profits. Don't keep everything in there because, you know, um, recently I think BTC.com, was it BTC or BTCE, was um, taken over by the U.S. government for money laundering. Was it BTC? I, I forgot the name. One of the exchanges was taken over for money laundering for the Mount Gox thing. And you know Bittrex, right? The head of compliance is the head for SEC compliance. So you know who sees your data, the SEC sees your data. All right. Wow, lots of info. So what, um, I wanna continue on that, but before we do, um, what are some of the projects that you're currently excited about and uh, different projects that you're investing in? 
So the first one is Substratum because Substratum is a decentralized internet. That is exactly what we need in today's world because you've got governments always looking at what we're doing. We've got China that can't even get on the internet because the governments just don't let them on the internet. Uh, North Korea, all these different places where the government just stop everything you do within the internet. So decentralized internet is going to be key going forward into the future. And this is basically what Substratum are doing. They're going to be getting their nodes out really soon, which is definitely going to help them going forward. And they're also going to be getting a lot more publicity because they're going on um, American TV. I believe it's one of the biggest uh, TV shows. And that's going to be big publicity for cryptocurrency and Substratum in general. And people are going to see this. They're going to be like, wow, decentralized internet, this is something that we need. Because like I said, at the moment, the internet is very centralized. We've got the big companies that just control the internet. We've got the governments that can uh, control the internet. So it's really bad at the moment. And the next one is Power Ledger. So if you haven't heard of Power Ledger, basically, it's where you can sell your energy to your next door neighbor. So they use solar panel energy. And basically, if you are next door to your next door neighbor or anybody around you, you can sell it to them on the platform that they are currently building. So this is going to be key because say if you have got solar panels on your house and then you're going to work, so that energy that you have got uh, through your solar, uh, solar panels, you can't actually do anything with that because you are going to work. So it's basically uh, energy that you are not using. But with uh, power ledger, you can actually sell this to your next door neighbor or anybody around the world, which is fantastic in my eyes. Same question. Yeah. Uh, sure, so from my perspective, slightly different. I rather focus on things that are mineable. I mean, that's for a very, um, very simple reason, because I think the SEC is going to kill pretty much most of these securities, aka tokens. I mean, there can be a substantial pressure on all the exchanges. And also, if you follow up, to, uh, I think it was to, uh, yesterday that the Nasdaq actually said that, okay, we, well, we might actually list some of the tokens because they're securities. So pretty much they are trying to grasp as much market because they are fully regulated, they can do it. And then it's a problem for American exchanges like Bitrex that was mentioned that they might have serious problems with compliance with the SEC. And SEC is uh, sort of like... A, Overseer, not just in US, but they are loving to go to other jurisdictions and even dig to other exchanges uh, that are serving US customers. And uh, this is precisely why we see some exchanges moving, let's say, to jurisdictions like Malta. But they don't even realize the fact that even in Malta, it's subject to EU regulations, EU law. So pretty much it will be exactly the same stuff as anywhere in, uh, in Europe or European Union. So from my perspective, I rather focus on something that's mineable, that's something that's a very solid team, you know, that has certain traction. Actually, I was following, I mean, if we are talking like anonymity, I think I, I like the verge where it's going because it's actually partnering, there's some utility, you know, I mean, not saying mention the company here, <laughs> so you can look it up. And so, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of others that are like uh, sub uh, 200, uh, you know, just merging with some interesting ideas, especially uh, you know, projects where you see scientists working on a, let's say, totally new, either it's an algo or it's a, it's a new way how to structure certain things around. So um, it's more like a general advice, you know, you have to really look it up, you know, what's going on in terms of the regulation. Uh, even if you purchase these currencies or you mine something, you have to also think about how you're going to prove, even to authorities, if you are at some stage trying to convert into fiat, that, you know, what is the source of crypto, you know, because these things, you know, at certain volumes will be asked, you know, and you know, there are certain implications in terms of, as, as I mentioned, anti-money laundering and uh, taxation. So, you know, you have to be quite strategic because within like two, three uh, years, someone might just say, okay, well, this is precisely the same as you are, you know, running your business, you know, and there can be potentially huge tax implications in certain jurisdictions. They are going literally crazy in terms of taxation. So, you know, it's just very general advice. RJ, what's your record? Come to Singapore, we don't tax you guys. <laughs> okay, so basically when it comes to buying tokens, right, I'm not a big fan of technology. I'm not a big fan of what it can do because I'm a big fan of money. I like money. My money likes me. And I do, we all like money. Let's face it. People can tell me to my face, it's RJ, a you know, people Everybody can tell me to my face, strategy. RJ, the, the technology is important. I'm like, yeah, try to bring your technology and buy a burger at McDonald's. McDonald's said, go away. Right? So I like to 
follow the, the trend of the market. So when I trade, you see, when I first started trading and I started, I, I was a trader back then. You, you got to see the market right now. So way back when the stock market started, right? It was penny stocks. Everyone's rushing and buying stuff. So you had people who didn't know what stock market was, what penny stocks was. They were all buying. The same thing is happening right now. If you put the graph of the penny stocks back then and the graph of the crypto market when it first started, it's an exact carbon copy. Uh, maybe give or take 2%. Everyone rushes to buy. So right now you got to understand who you're trading with. You're trading with a bunch of people who don't know left from right. If I say go and buy something, you'll see the thing go up. So when I try to buy something right now in the market, I look at the trend. Like EOS right now, everyone wants to mine a, a block of EOS. If you go for EOS right now, you will make money. And if EOS succeeds, great. Everyone becomes a billionaire. If EOS doesn't succeed, worst case, you make 10 million bucks. Or 20 million bucks and then you take that money go and buy a penthouse in you know in, in Colombia or, or somewhere so the thing here is my favorite right now is EOS which I have from the start and yeah our ledger for sure and I also like Neo I like Neo because of one thing the Chinese people any Chinese people here before I say something <laughs> I'm Indian so great the Chinese people don't like to lose face and Neo was made out to be the Chinese Ethereum you think they're going to let NEO fall down? They're not. The reason why China is uh, you know, blocking everything is because they're about to run with NEO. They're they are planning something big with NEO and RPX. Okay? It will run and it will go. The reason why I'm saying this is because I'm from Singapore. Everyone got a Google handphone. I want you guys to write this down. It's called Project Ubin, U-B-I-N. Okay? It is being built on the Ethereum nodes. They are building the banking infrastructure for the entire world in Singapore. It's being built by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Well, we're one of the richest countries in the world and the safest countries in the world. It's being backed by the Bank of America. Guess who? JP Morgan, early investor who says Bitcoin is bad. Bank of India, Bank of China, a lot of bunch of people. It will roll out in the year 2020. And when that happens, you'll be forced to use crypto and you'll be forced to only use crypto that they deem usable from now till then the market is like the wild wild west you can do whatever you want you can play the market you can pump the market you can dump the market so make your money where you can i would say go for eos and neo if you're buying neo buy gas because if you look at the trend if neo goes up gas goes up because without gas neo doesn't <coughs> run and without neo there's no gas buy this boat you probably make a bunch of money as well. Oh, and Cardano. Cardano was good. Well, by the way, I was the only one in the world to call Cardano at two cents. I say five weeks later, it'd be richer shit. Yeah. So. so it's interesting because you have a really different approach from uh, other traders. I mean, and and it's interesting because a lot of the general knowledge is hold, 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 and it's kind of what's been happening for the last three plus month and a lot of these different crypto groups on Facebook and even Telegram, everyone's like holding to their dear life uh, because the market went down. And I mean, following you, RJ, I know you were saying bye, bye, bye. <laughs> um, so what what's your overall strategy? Uh, and I guess we're talking about trading now. Like what, what's your overall strategy uh, when you're trading? Uh, do you have any recommendations for beginners? Um, so I would say hold for the long term the projects that you truly do believe in. And then as we've already spoke about, catching trends is a great way to make a lot of money. Like if you're in the cryptocurrency market late last year, there was a trend where, as we've already spoke about, these uh, penny cryptocurrencies were all shooting up after one another. So I think Ripple started off, then we had Cardano, then we had uh, a lot of other cryptocurrencies that were literally pennies. We got a lot of newbies coming into the market around that time and they were just like, okay, this is cheap, I'm going to buy this, this is cheap, I'm going to buy this, this is cheap. But another thing is you've got to take some profit. Even if you're doing long-term holding, you've got to take some profit. Like if you buy a cryptocurrency at $0.10 and then it's gone all the way to $10, you've got to take some sort of profit because nobody knows what's going to be happening in cryptocurrency tomorrow. The cryptocurrency market could go down tomorrow, it could crash tomorrow, it could just disappear. Nobody knows for sure. But um, yeah, so taking profit and yeah. Robert, that's for sure. I mean, you know, if you if you if you happen to be like early investor, you know, it's all set somehow. 
you know, if you're an early investor in new projects and somehow, you know, it goes up, you can't afford to hold it long term because you're still in profit, you're not like experiencing huge losses. But I remember the time it was like around December, the Coinbase was sending around this email that, oh, guys, you should be like cautious buying this and that, you know, that you should uh, trade safely. And it was exactly at the time when uh, the, the whole market was uh, going exponential. It, it, it wasn't sustainable. Any sort of uh, technical charting analyst would just say, okay, this is going to pop. And actually that happened. It was a few months later on. After that, you know, even uh, the miners, you know, investors, ICOs, everyone sort of, you know, well, this is like the, the end of the world. But precisely this is the timing when uh, you can have the best trading opportunities maybe of this year. So uh, generally, I think, you know, you have to look at the volumes. You have to look uh, what what is the liquidity on the market. Actually, you, you if you are trading something more exotic, you have to be very cautious, you know, if you if you get it listed on some reputable exchanges, which is difficult to find nowadays. But uh, overall, you know, the volume is extremely good uh, indicator what's going on on the market. If you see that volumes are shooting up generally, you know, that's uh, the signal that there will be uptrend. So, I mean, this is, this is the strategy overall. And I think, you know, you also have to pay attention again to regulations because if you have a major economy announcing something, usually, you know, uh, it's not taken lightly by the market. Usually, it goes down, but again, that creates opportunities as well. But again, you know, it's you. You have to be very cautious, and you know, uh, if you're not going like most of the people, like all in, you know, I think for more reasonable, you know, purposes is good. You know, if you limit to more, maybe a few percentages of your net worth, but again, that's uh, everyone's personal decision. So. But, you know, it's, it's not like your pension fund will be built uh, purely on crypto. I mean, you have to be very cautious, as it was said. No one knows where the market will go. It can go eventually to zero in certain jurisdictions. You don't want to, you know, be uh, trading some of your assets on black market only. So, you know, it's really up to the consideration of every individual. Hey, you know what I tell my, I tell my friends? We traders are like doctors. We always guess. We don't know for sure what's happening. Like doctors, you go, hey dog, I think you got a flu. Maybe you got cancer. <laughs> That's what traders are like, right? That's like traders are the same thing. We don't know. We're all predicting, right? So when you go and trade, right now, okay, I mean, everyone is different. Everyone's got different threshold. I always tell people this. Only trade with money that you can lose and still sleep like a baby at night. Only use that money. But right now, it's like the wild, wild west. You're given an opportunity to literally make as much money as you want. If you don't take a chance, if you don't jump in, three years later, five years later, you wake up and it's a regulator and you look back like, I wish I put that 10 grand inside, 20 grand. Inside. Because 20, 10, 20, 30,000, even $50,000. If you lose, might feel a pinch for some of us, but it's only 50 grand. You can make it back in a couple of years, a couple of months. It's only money, right? <laughs> Even if you lose ten thousand dollars, right? I mean, let's let's face it. Even if you lose ten grand, it's only ten grand. You can still make it back. It's not lost. Remember KFC? He made his money at seventy-three years old. But don't wait till then. Too old. All right. So trade with a high, a high risk, but don't trade on credit. Use money that you can lose and trade with high risk because right now you are poised. And God has blessed all of us to be born to witness a change in financial revolution. Because back in the day, chocolate was money in Colombia. Salt was money in Egypt. Right now, my mother used it in food. If you don't take a chance on yourself, what's the point of trading in crypto? Because right now, you can put $1,000 and you can walk away with a million dollars. Like in Coronado, I put in 100 grand, I walk away with $6.5 million. Five weeks. It's a risk. A lot of people made money with that trade. When they follow me, I give it up for free. If you don't take a risk, even on five grand or 10 grand, then there's no point in trading crypto. Because if your idea is to make $100 a month or 2,000 a month, then this is not the place to play it because two grand, you can have another job. If you want to make generational wealth where you can keep money for, you know, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your dog, for your fish, now is the time to make it, all right? Now is the time to take that risk, but never trade on credit, never take loans, trade with money you can afford to lose and still, still sleep like a baby. Because there are still so many other coins that's going to come out at less than one cent that's going to go to a thousand bucks or a hundred dollars. There's some new coin I never heard of, I didn't even buy it, it's called 
Mitchell, I just saw it today. It's like 1,300. I said, what coin is this? I was asking people, dude, what coin is this? It's got 2,700 Bitcoins, 24 volumes. Like, there's a, a lot of money to be made down there. So there's always another coin that will come out. Take some risk. Don't be scared. You won't go broke. As long as you're alive, you'll make it all back. And you won't be scared. <laughs> That's it. And don't trade when you're drinking, okay? I don't think it's that easy. You have to teach us the secret. Well, anyways. Um, okay, so there's a few things. Um, first, I'd like to ask who here is involved in blockchain technology, ICOs? Like, raise your hand. ICOs. Okay, so I definitely want to ask that one last question. Uh, but before we do, I want to ask mining, and then I'm going to open up the floor. So, mining, is it completely dead or not? <laughs> well, you know, I like to ask contra controversial questions. <laughs> yeah, so, it's, you know, I've been, I've been uh, mining for a while. We do it for clients. We do it for, like, uh, you know, hedge funds. And um, the thing is that, firstly, you know, mining is not like uh, something, you know, general. You know, you have Essex, you know, for Bitcoin, so Litecoin, you know, some major crypto. Then you have GPUs, you know, for, let's say, the newer currencies. And also you have proof of stake, master nodes, you know, that is sort of the similar way of mining, but without using uh, generally the hardware. And I would say that, you know, it's really up to the combination, the cost of hardware, cost of your electricity, cost of your facilities, you know, and also it's a bit of a trading because if you are focusing just on one currency, you go all the way in, you know, it's, it's pretty much like buying the thing, you know. And then there is only one question, is it more efficient to buy or is it more efficient to mine? And this is a very tricky question and it's very down to the technicals. I generally don't think that the mining is dead. I mean, you know, the part of the market is definitely dying. You know, if you, you know, I, I was like approached to buy Dash miners back in uh, November for, I don't know, 15,000 euros or something. <laughs> Nowadays, they, they, they sell them for almost like for free. You know, it's like a very expensive heater, in my opinion, and that's actually, you know, yeah. So, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm a real big fan of Bitmain, you know, they're just a great company making more money than NVIDIA. Binance is making more money than Deutsche Bank. You know, so, you know, certainly, you know, these people are not dying, you know, I think some of their customers might, but uh, we'll see what the future will bring. I don't think that the proof of work is totally dead. I think there are new projects coming, you know, that might change the landscape. But in general, it's really down to diversification and really doing your calculations, doing your, um, like, exposure, doing your, uh, you know, uh, what, because, like, with mining, you have so many hidden costs and so many uh, risks. You know, it's really, do you have the technical team, you know, if you are investing like literal millions, you know, you have to pay attention to every detail, even to like humidity in the room, etc. So that's, that's almost a completely different ball game. And uh, you have lots of these like retail miners jumping on the ball and just doing the same thing. But I think these guys will not be competitive enough. And literally we see that lots of these things will move to countries with extremely cheap electricity. And obviously the gas Yes, they are trying to censor us again, so maybe I just pass my my you know, my uh, more than you. Yes, I think that's a sign for us to go and party. That's a point. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so basically when it comes to mining, um, I am basically one of the 15 mining pools of the Bitcoin hash rate distribution. There's only 15 mining pools, one of them is ours. We mine five percent of the world's bitcoins. So when it comes to mining right now, mining is not dead, but if you're mining on a small scale, you are dead. Because you will make profit in the start, and then as, the, as it goes by, right, your costs become a lot more expensive, and you cannot sustain it. So you need a big facility to mine it. Um, the thing I tell people is this, easy way. Imagine, well, who here likes fishing? Fishing? Fishing sucks. If, imagine, right, if I go fishing, I bring one fishing rod, I throw it in the pond, I may not catch a fish, but if all four of us bring one fishing rod each, we throw the rod and say he catches one fish, we split it into four. So that's what we're doing right now, using the mining pool, which is one of the 15 mining pools on the Bitcoin hash rate. Money is not dead, but you need a lot more machines to be profitable. It's no longer where you have two machines and you can have enough Bitcoins to probably buy a Lamborghini. It doesn't happen anymore. As time goes by, it'll be a lot more difficult 
and a lot more expensive to mine. If you want to visit us, come to Iceland. We've got 43 acres in Iceland at a bird facility. Come visit us. All right, so one last question before I open up to the floor. Um, ICOs, um, and when you're interested in starting your own ICO, what would be sort of the first recommendation you would give uh, someone who's looking into starting? And since we're in Europe, let's say Europe, because uh, obviously there's different regulation whether you're in Europe or in the US. So what's sort of like the first step you'd recommend, Harvard? See your lawyer. <laughs> no, literally, I mean, in in the US, I mean, that's completely a different ball game. Uh, pretty much everything is down to SEC, and everything seems to be security. So very difficult. Maybe easier to just you know raise the money elsewhere. And in terms of Europe, uh, you have various jurisdictions. You know, everyone's taking slightly different approach. We see some very interesting things going on in very exotic jurisdictions but in general you know there is a not like uh, one template but uh, so far I think you know the, the climate is quite good for ICOs in Europe you know it might change because again you know if there are high-profile scams you know some jurisdiction will just shut it down somehow you know they'll find a way but so far you know uh, I think you know you can find at least you know five to ten European countries where to, um, to doing to do your ICOs is very very easy but as I mentioned, you will have like fifth uh, anti-money laundering directive kicking in the place. And then even if you raise some money for your project, you know, it can be literally something very, very exciting. You might have a problem because suddenly you find out that none of the banks want to actually accept your cash or your crypto or anything in that regard. Although we are working with few of the banks that are accepting or opening, opening accounts in the crypto and it's uh, down to the KYC and all checks. So as far as you can't prove, you know, where is your crypto coming from down to the certain UBOs or, or ultimate beneficiary owners, you might have a tough luck to even open a bank account or to actually use cash in the future. So as far as you're planning to just live on Ethereum or any sort of other crypto, you know, you are doing fine. But probably that will be extremely difficult if you're trying to build a company unless you are in Belize you know, or you know, some of these jurisdictions. So for Europe, it's uh, really easy to raise some crypto, but then again, you have to pay attention. You have to talk to your lawyers and accountants that you will be compliant and you can actually exchange it for, for cash and then use the proceeds uh, for building up your business or your project. So really that, that would be the high level sort of advice. Again, you know, you should also pay attention to, to any developments that are going on in terms of taxation in uh, your very jurisdiction. So if you see that, you know, you might be getting taxed, you know, out of the business, you know, well, that might not be the jurisdiction that you want to start your business or your project. Well, I'll give you the best advice. Firstly, find a country that you cannot be extradited for, right? They cannot send you back to Spain to face criminal charges. Number two, run and hide. Because even if your ICO looks legit at first, like right now we're doing ICOs called Pitch Investors Live. We have Kevin Harrington on board. He's the original Shark Tank guy, the guy who started Shark Tank, if you guys know Shark Tank. So he's with us now. So right now, we're all legit. But tomorrow, some government in some country might wake up and say, hey, all the money you raised is now illegal, and the way you converted the Ethereum you collected to cash is considered money laundering. So all of you guys are going to go to prison for the next 30 years. <laughs> so that might happen. We don't know. So when you do an ICO, I always tell people right now, base it out of Singapore, because Singapore government is very pro-ICO friendly. All the biggest cryptos in the world have an office in Singapore because it's friendly, and our government is strict, so the laws and legislations they put there, the SEC cannot touch us in Singapore. The US government has got no power in Singapore at all because they owe us a bunch of money. So they have no jurisdiction in Singapore. They can bully everybody else. But they cannot I bully think you work countries. for the Singapore government. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. So, no. But, I mean, I'm giving, like, you know, real stuff. Like, in, in even 10x. You know 10x belongs to PayPal, right? Okay, 10x belongs to PayPal. Because 10x was one of the three incumbents that PayPal took on this wing to help them to come up. So, 10x is the main office 
inside PayPal. So uh, even VHS, uh, Vitalik was in Singapore, staying there for like a couple of, uh, almost six months to build the project will be on Ethereum nodes. So when Singapore is building the banking system for the whole world and it's being backed by the US government and everybody else, do you think that they are going to come to Singapore when you do an ICO and then say, you know what, we're going to screw you. They're not going to do that because all of them have got a lot of money invested in this project. And a lot of them have a lot of, uh, of the HQs based out of Singapore. So choosing the right country is very important for the ICO. If you choose the wrong country, and you raise a lot of money and they don't like your face, they can just tell you, hey, you're wrong. And, and how are you going to prove they're not wrong? It's you against the government. You can't fight it. So choose the correct country. I would say go with Singapore, go with Malta. These are the two that I would recommend for now. The rest, not so. It's interesting you say that because oh, what's, happening, what's happening with Facebook and the whole cap, uh, Cambridge Analytics I mean, in some way, that's kind of what's happening. Like, he must have pissed, I mean, this is my personal theory, okay? So don't quote me on this. But I, I think he pissed off the wrong people, and now the government is after him. Because, I mean, let's face it, uh, they, yeah, I mean, they, I mean, I'm an advertiser, so I know the dark secrets of Facebook. And uh, we've been mining data since you even knew about it. So, uh, yeah, it's really interesting that it just came out in the press now. But regardless, that's a whole nother topic. Um, okay, so I want to open up the floor. So if you guys have any questions for our panelists, please. Don't be shy. I have a question. Um, for Robert, it would be, what do you think are the front runners now in, in decentralized exchanges at the moment? So I hear about Wix, for example, or uh, IDEX. Which ones do you think are more at the best? And then do you think for example, if, uh, if Binance or uh, Coinbase jump into the decentralized exchange, it would be easy, or, or what are the, uh, the problems there to face for them? Uh, so maybe I'll start with the second one. Um, you know, running a decentralized exchange, I mean, if it's a true decentralized exchange, it means it's a pretty much a protocol where no one can sort of exercise their power over the network. So pretty much, in ideal world, you have your crypto, you trade it against something else, and you still have your private keys and your crypto pretty much on your wallet. That's a very ideal case. But again, if you if you really follow up the development in terms of regulations and um, you know, as I mentioned, AMLs, then you then you see that this opens up the door for let's say even the bad guys. Like it was uh, said here, you know. The Bitcoin originally, you know, everyone thought, oh, it's just the drug dealers and a bunch of gamers. But, you know, the, you have serious businesses, you know, trying to approach it and they need to have certain clearance with their banks because at some stage they want to exchange some of their crypto into uh, FIA or SEPA payments in Europe. And in this case, I see that it will be extremely difficult to run a true decentralized exchange as, as we would envision that, okay, I have all the private keys and it's totally anonymous. And I don't, there is no name, there is no KYC, there is no data, no personal data on a blockchain. And then I, I see guys, they, they go, oh, well, you know, there is this KYC ML. And what I'll do, I'll, I'll do my internal KYC and I somehow put it in the blockchain. And then this goes against what the GDPR is saying, that you can't have any private information, personal data on a blockchain. So pretty much, I think that currently the state in Europe is that you can't really have the true exchange or true decentralized exchange to a certain degree. So it's it's uh, I think for 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 Binance, it's it's very crucial that they actually develop the decentralized exchange because they are trying to kill them off in so many jurisdictions. And I think you know if they figure out what the EU is doing, then you know they'll move out from Malta as well. It will be extremely difficult to do that, the global business out of out of Malta. I think that it literally will end up in, in some, you know, countries, as we mentioned, that do not extradite, you know, their citizens or their business people. So it might be Singapore, it might be a different country. And then uh, maybe the first question, you know, the uh, decentralized exchanges that I'm, that I'm following, you know, I'm, I'm really like following these like almost underground exchanges. They are very interesting in terms of their approach. There are so many of them popping up almost on a monthly basis. You know, uh, if, you, if you're doing lots of like master node coins, you know, that, you know, I'm some, sort, of, sort of a mining as well. You know, you, you come up with, you know, projects like a crypto bridge and you see that 
you know, it's uh, based on the uh, bit shares, but on the other hand, uh, these things will be precisely things that will be put maybe beyond certain firewall in EU. Because EU is actually saying one interesting thing, that if you are not following our regulation like GDPR, AML, and you are serving European customers, you will be shut down from our internet. So it's almost like a Chinese model to a certain degree. I'm not saying it's a good or bad. It's just, you know, they can get extremely tough on certain services that are provided to European clients. So what we might see is that, you know, it might be certain hybrids that you have, you know, one proportion that is decentralized. You know, somehow you can uh, keep the keys, but there will still be some centralized component in it which can sort of comply and be accountable towards authorities. Unless, if it's not like that, it will be just shut down, you know, by the government to at a certain level or at a certain time. I'm trying to get the questions going, so maybe we can look at some questions. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Can I? Yes. Uh, what is your take on zero time? Okay, uh, well, that's uh, slightly, uh, you know, they, they can provide lots of services in you. So far, it was very interesting jurisdiction for certain projects, but again, you know, with the UK thing like the Brexit, you know, it will be extremely uncertain long term or mid term. Because if Brexit occurs to, you know, it seems that, you know, it's going to happen, then, you know, the position in the UK serving uh, European markets will be very difficult. And Gibraltar will pretty much follow the UK. So I think uh, for, for this, it brings lots of uncertainty. It's really, if you... If you will are, get better? You will go, go. Uh, you know, you, it's like you if, you, if you want to serve certain markets, you need to be a very good friend of that particular government, pretty much. If, you, if they don't like your face, if they don't like your project, you're out. No matter what. You know, you can have the best lawyers, you can have the best accountants. It doesn't matter. You know, long term, you are dead. So, really, it's, it's, it's uh, the need is to be compliant with this jurisdiction, and they somehow need to, like, I don't know, I, I don't have a receipt for that, but, you know, you just, you just, make, you have to make sure that they, they like, like with Singapore, you know, that they just say, okay, all the technicians, all the developers come to our country and do these projects. You, you have to follow something like that. You see, like, examples like Estonia, you know, they are extremely proactive, they are writing new laws, and it's always business friendly for, like, a digital economy. And then you have Poland, which is just, you know, a few miles from there, and it's just completely different approach. But that might actually change, you know, maybe in the future. We see that in France, you know, it was like so anti-blockchain and cryptocurrencies, and then after a few months, they just figure out, oh, maybe that's a good idea. So it's it's quite funny that you see like these various signals, and I think that at some stage, you know, the EU needs to also build its own competitiveness in the world, and they actually figure out, okay, maybe we'll put certain framework or template how to do the things, and actually, you know, they put more certainty on the market. But currently, you know, it's, it's these things can change all, overnight. Even like European Parliament, they just can pass legislation that are banning cryptocurrencies, you know, or taxing them, you know, out of existence. There's also one approach, and then oh, you are just left with like uh, black markets, but this is not really a way to go long term, I hope. Okay, before, uh, I just want to make a little announcement before we continue with the questions. So, you each have a little piece of paper. Today's event is not about Lambos, it's about yachts getting your yet by the end of the year. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but in any case, so in the paper, if you could put your name and whether or not you're interested in mining, because we're going to do a raffle where you're going to have an opportunity to win uh, cloud mining, uh, as well as nano ledgers and some t-shirts. So somebody's going to come through to collect and we're going to do, uh, we're going to do the little raffle. So uh, next question. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Yes, the little paper that was on your chair. So write your name and write whether or not you're into mining because we don't want to give mining uh, to someone who's not into it. And, uh, and then we'll announce it when we're done with the question. So we're going to do two last questions because then I just want to make sure that we get uh, time to, for networking because uh, the spot closes at a nine on the dot. So uh, we're pressed with time here. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, I have a question for Robert since he's into mining. I understand uh, the basic of uh, mining as a validation of transaction and securing of the network. Could you shortly elaborate maybe on the concept of uh, proof of stake and master node? What is the difference between them? Because they seem quite similar to some degree. 
Yes, so, so, so maybe start from the very beginning, you know. Uh, Bitcoin is the very example of proof of work. I mean, after some time, you know, some people started experimenting with a different sort of approach, uh, how to validate and how to come up to the consensus in terms of, you know, securing the blockchains. And uh, also some people are quite thoughtful in terms of the impact on the environment. As we know, you know, just mining the Bitcoin Ethereum is just, you know, consuming so much electricity that you can literally power the entire countries in the world. And uh, proof of stake is pretty much using like a similar hashing algorithm, but it doesn't necessarily require you to, you know, compete in terms of your hashing power. And uh, therefore, it somehow opens the door that you can, you, as far as you are risking, you know, literally you are you might be risking some of your coins as far as there is a split chain. Uh, by staking them, you are actually uh, uh, validating the new block. And uh, in terms of master nodes, it's a really very similar approach. It's just the amount is fixed and it's way higher, or usually it's way higher. And a good example, I mean, of this is Dash, which is also a fork of Bitcoin, but uh, that uh, was also based partially on this master node, which is pretty much um, implementing this uh, proof of partially implementing this proof of stake uh, with given uh, power parameters. And also it was used for mixing up the transaction to make uh, some of the payments anonymous or instant. But uh, at very high level, in terms of, uh, let's say, economics, you know, if, if people are more interested in money than in technology, it literally is like a mini bank that you just have certain amount of your currency or the units and you stake them or you put them in the master node and they reproduce themselves at certain return on investment per year, which can be maybe five, six, seven percent as per dash or it can be even hundreds uh, for some other, I would say, altcoins. I mean, it's, it's a different approach, it's a different trading strategy, but I mean, if you are looking into more stable passive income, you know, it might be a way, you know, as far as you're not trying to make, you know, you know, 50 times per year, you know, it might be interesting, interesting approach as well, you know, so, I mean, if that partially answers your question, Absolutely. thank you. Next question over here. Thank you so much. Uh, there was the issue mentioned earlier about how do you have a stable market uh, when companies continue to change jurisdictions? And I think you were mentioning, you know, Singapore, to Malta, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm thinking about uh, reports in the past, there was, I think, a commentary made in London about systemic risk. And it's the, obviously the perceived versus the actual risk. And so if we're just looking at, say, individual markets, the UK, the US, or other places, how much does this change of jurisdiction, how much risk or destabilization potential is there? Do we need to worry about it? Or is it like, you know, it'll be tolerated, but you can still rest at night? Do you, is that clear? Sure, sure. And, uh, this is a very important question, and it's uh, straight to the point. Uh, I think the biggest uh, risk in terms of uh, cryptos in general is Tether. If you, if you know the whole story, you know, I'm, I'm not going to explain you, literally you need to read something on that, but it was really when the, um, the Bitcoin and the overall market was speaking, you know, you've seen that they were like, you know, pretty much issue, issuing this IOU that are sort of backed by the USD on a daily basis, and that was in like hundreds of millions. And that was so correlated with the jumps in the BTC that it was so suspicious. And lots of exchanges, almost like majority of, from Binance to hit BTC, are using the stature to actually process lots of this transaction. And it's actually the second or third, depending on the day, most traded uh, uh, crypto in the world. It's even more traded uh, at certain days than Ethereum. So it's, it's a huge factor. And if something happens to this, I think there can be like major correction to the degree that Literally, you can get these uh, regulators and governments freaking out and it's like, like a complete scam and they will just banning things outright. And I think this is the biggest systematic risk. So uh, what, what uh, some of the exchanges are doing, they are saying that, okay, we will deterioraze the markets, but it's not literally happening because if you look at the volumes, it's not like decreasing. So it's so much linked. I mean, even the price levels, the volumes. And, you know, from my perspective, if it's not a cash market and spot cash market is not real market, you know, you can manipulate it. And most of these exchanges are not audited, they are not regulated. It's literally, you can set it up right now, it can be a partial video game, you know, like you are investing into cryptos, I say, okay, this is the price, and it actually works. 
But if everyone decides to withdraw suddenly, you know, certain amounts, so they say, oh, I want actually some cash. And they say, oh, there is a problem because there is a limit. There are actually cases when people made so much money that they were unable to withdraw money from, let's say, Coinbase to pay their tax liabilities. And we actually discussed one case in, in Poland that, let's say, if you're running like high frequency trading, you can actually own way more money to the government than you actually made from the trades. It's extreme, but I mean, you know, that's legislation. So, so I'll, I'll just add a line, excuse me, your recommendation earlier to sell at the end of the day for your, at least your profits. If everyone's doing that, that would seem to be precisely what he's warning about. Am I mistaken? Well, I didn't say ask everyone to sell. I said those people who trade enough volume to sell to take out their profits. Because you need to take out, because each exchange has got its own volume. Bittrex has got its own volume. If Bittrex shuts down, you still have Binance has its own volume. OK Exchange has its own volume. Each exchange has its own individual daily volume. So it doesn't purely necessarily affect the whole market. Like how China went out, right? They banned all Chinese people. Yeah, the market came down and came back right up. So even if one exchange shuts down, it doesn't matter. It still keeps going on and on. Even if the United States, China, and India don't want to be part of crypto, it still goes on because <laughs> the market is there, and, and, the, and there's a lot of people who, who know that they can safeguard their money and keep their money in there. Like right now, it's a wild, wild west. Anything and everything can happen. Tomorrow, everything can go down the drains. And yes, USDT is a problem. And it's not going to go away. It's not a problem that's going to go away so fast unless something really bad happens and USDT just collapses because there's so much volume in, in Tether. Uh, the last the question over there. We do have an ICO. Would you make sure to close the broker and to GDPR on the last week of broker? We didn't hear that. Sorry. Could the you last part. The last part. Would you make sure to close the broker and to GDPR on the right week of broker and to have two different days in the name coming into the future? I mean, uh, certainly. You know, I, I don't know your project, but um, you know what people are suggesting that if you're dealing with like uh, personal data, that it should be stored off chain. So you know, technically, you can you can probably do it. In terms of regulation, you know, it's pretty strict. So as far as any sort of personal data is touching the blockchain, it's like done and it's over. It's legal. I mean, it's it's as as extreme, but I mean, you know, this is how it's written. So. <laughs> Actually, I don't like the whole sort of ICO thing, you know, I, I, I did few of them in the past, you know, I have the skeletons in my closet, you know, I just shut it down. <laughs> and, you know, I, I said it during during our, our talk that, you know, I'm more focused on, on uh, mineable coins, you know, not, not really not really going into ICOs that much. I mean, there were a few, literally a few, that are quite interesting enough, but uh, down to the bottom, you know, they are about certain technologies and, you know, at the end they'll be using maybe some proof of work concept. So this is, you know, I actually focus on things that I kind of understand, or at least I think that I understand. I don't like, you know, this, you know, we are building a quantum time machine, you know, and it's priceless. So, no, don't trust these, these people, so. Well, firstly, I'll put in my own ICO. Well, okay, so basically, some of the ICOs that I put money recently, um, I put into Bank to the Future. So we had a private deal, very private deal, which we put in. Because Bank to the Future is, if those of you guys who don't know what's Bank to the Future, they're actually like a Kickstarter. They help a lot of other coins and exchanges raise money. They help Binance raise $300 million. They kind of own part of Binance. They help uh, OK Exchange, who buy a lot of bunch of exchanges are there. So I put money in Bank to the Future because I know it's sustainable because they're not selling a dream, or they're not selling you some you know, magic dust or, or throw something in your eyes. They literally are a platform like Kickstarter, but they help ICOs and, and tokens raise money for the project. The other one that I just put money into is called Coins Payment. If those of you guys who don't know Coins Payment, it's owned by a couple of friends of mine. It's like the PayPal of the crypto world. They accept, I think, uh, a lot of cryptos. And it's instant. So if I were to come to your e-com store, and you can integrate it with Shopify, because I, I run Shopify as well. So if you came to my store and you bought something on crypto, the payment back to you is immediate. 
You don't have, it's not like PayPal, it goes to PayPal, you wait for PayPal to freeze your money, and then PayPal sends you back to you. Coin payment has about a 700,000 user base. Um, I think they were doing about $100 million in revenue. Right now it's about 30 or $40 million in revenue. I put in it because I understand that coins payment will eventually be bigger than PayPal in the crypto space because of the sheer number of user base, plus I know the people who run it. So yeah, these are the two that I just put in. And coin payments is happening right now. You can take a look, it's called coin payments. I don't own coin payments, by the way. Thank you so much. Please give the speakers a big round of applause. Yay. Sorry, no, we're running out of time. So, um, okay, I want to thank our sponsors for this evening. The first one being One Cowork. Thank you so much for uh, letting us have access to this beautiful space tonight. And they're actually opening up apparently another co-working space in the Plaza de Catalunya because they're completely booked here. And I mean, looking at yachts on a daily, it's nice motivation, right? Uh, and then also want to thank Ikula. Uh, if you want to give a quick rundown of what you guys do, and then Eterbase, and then uh, want to do the raffle as well before we uh, get to network. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Luna, to let us sponsor this event. It's the second time we're doing it. I think pretty good, uh, pretty good attention uh, attendance. Uh, I'm Jama Frisha. I'm the country manager of Ecula in Spain. Uh, basically, we are an infrastructure provider. We have uh, data centers. And just to give you a small uh, explanation about what's happening in our market regarding blockchain, there's companies that are supporting blockchain and companies that they are really not supporting blockchain, basically. And we are one of the companies as infrastructure as a service uh, that we support blockchain and in, all, in all ways, even for mining. Uh, so yeah, Robert was mentioning before that the GPU servers or ASICs are servers to be used to, to mine. Uh, we do not have uh, ASIC servers, but we can host uh, these servers in our in our uh, data centers. So this is one of the services we can we can offer. We also have some partners we can work with. We can connect you to to other um, miners that uh, they are trying to to create a, a mining pools. Um, we give, we give also information from our own people. So we're getting quite involved in this. And also more specifically about the GPU servers, I would like to say that. Normally, miners are um, buying the hardware, which is a uh, high cost, you know, not just to buy the, the servers, also for, um, for yeah, maintain the servers, it's quite expensive. So we just give uh, the option to these people that want to invest, or at least just try uh, to rent the server, uh, paying, the, paying a monthly with a fixed fee. And yeah, if, you, if it doesn't work, if you don't know how it works, or yeah, in the end, uh, you can just cut and uh, you stop paying and you don't have any commitment with us. So these are a little bit the options. If you want to find out more, maybe during the networking, you can come to me and I'll be very happy to to uh, explain you. About the, yeah, of course, our raffle is a GPU server for three months for free to test if you want, if you're interested in mining. So let's go for that. Thank you very much. So we're going to play a little game. I'm going to have each of you talk about the different projects that you're uh, working on, but it has to be under two, two, two minutes because you guys are, well, it's good. You're providing a lot of information. <laughs> uh, and then while you do that, you're going to pick a name. So we have a lot of gifts, actually. So we have, uh, yeah, three nano, and then I, I think I'm giving away, I'll have to count how many t-shirts. But, uh, okay, so let's do this. It's going to be fun. Talk about the projects that we're interested in. Yes. The, no, the project, what you're currently working on, uh, where people can follow you on YouTube, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me to this event. So currently I'm traveling all around Europe and all around the world and I put a bit of videos about that on my YouTube channel. You can follow me, Crypto Ellis. Also on that channel I like to do um, daily videos on what cryptocurrencies I think are potentially going to go up. Of course, always do your own research because nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, yeah, I like to do cryptocurrency news and a lot of other things. So yeah, go and follow me on Crypto Ellis. And then when you're there, you'll see all my other uh, channel links, so Instagram, Facebook, and all these other places. So, what do YouTubers always say to your own research? Is it because they don't want to get sued? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. 
no, no, pick a name. Pick a name. Currently, for past uh, six to uh, eight months, uh, I was um, involved with my project, which I co-founded with um, some other IT people. Uh, it's called Eterbase. Uh, it's currently kind of based in Liechtenstein, and pretty much, you know, today, you know, we are building a <laughs> centralized exchange. Uh, and uh, this is just the only part. You know, what we are trying to do in the long term is to build a solid financial institution that will be able to bridge literally the altcoins and uh, the fiat world, uh, what we have in Europe. Uh, it's the SEPA system, so we want to be directly integrated into SEPA. We want to integrate crypto and individual IBAN accounts, which uh, means that you'll be able not just to access the crypto, but actually you can use it you know, without utilizing crypto. You can just use it as a bank. We can do it way cheaply, so it's pretty much a combination of the crypto startup and fintech startup uh, in one project. Also, you know, as you noted, we are quite interested in terms of where the regulation is going and what are the sort of trends in terms of, you know, how we're going to, you know, regulate every single thing on this planet. But we are try trying to do it in a way that will benefit the customers and we want to actually make our, even you can check our platform, it's already on. We're actually going to release a pre-alpha version in next week. So you can uh, go to our white paper, it's at eaterbase.com, you know, we are not selling anything yet, so we will see how it goes, you know, we want to actually build an honest business that has a long-term potential, so please check it, uh, check us out at eaterbase.com, thank you. I don't have YouTube, I don't have fan page, you can follow me on my own page called RJ Regenerate, basically I travel and I do nothing much. Well, basically right now I'm working on a project called Altrex. Altrex is an exchange, it's a cryptocurrency exchange that will have everything that you ever wanted. Imagine having a trading stop loss. I wrote the code for that myself. Imagine right now you bought NEO, for example, you were sleeping and you put an auto buy for NEO at $10. The sale goes through. You wake up, NEO goes to $8, you're broke. But right now I'm gonna, I'm doing it in such a way where you can buy an auto buy Give it an instruction if the buy goes through and you're asleep, you can do a trading stop loss at 10%, 90%, 99%, 98%. So I've already written the code for that. Nobody in the world has the code for that except for me. <coughs> and it's going to have a lot of other goodies. I'm a, I just found out a way of how to you know, uh, merge fiat and crypto together. So basically, I just tell you guys. <laughs> so you know how you know how local bitcoins work, right? The guy gives you money and all that. So we're going to have the same thing in our exchange, peer to peer for every single coin. And if you are trading your coin, be it bitcoins or neo, or whatever, if you're selling your coins, it's going to be an escrow. And then you got to transfer money, but only with people in your own city. You can't do it across the world. It's going to be exciting. And I um, mean, we're about to raise 300 million in private funding. We've raised 100 million. It's being backed by the Bit chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation. If you don't know who that is, it's Brockius, one of the richest guys in crypto. So we got a lot of other people backing us up. So, it will take about eight months. Check us out later. All tracks exchange. Come and find me.